Hello and welcome to this keynote fireside at the virtual summit of the ET Prime Women Leadership Awards. Leadership may be an innate quality, but it can be learned. While some women may struggle with leadership, they need that little push perhaps, that vote of confidence in their ability. Now, how do we do that when the architecture of so many things in the world is kept with men at the center? How do we build and sustain a culture of women leadership? What can we do as women to shine? Today, I have someone with me who shines very bright, someone who's seen facets and dealt with many issues and challenges of being a leader, a woman leader. And I'm very happy to welcome Nena Lalkidwai, the chairperson of Rothschild India and chairperson of the India Sanitation Coalition. She's on the board of many companies. She was the past president of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry and retired in December 2015 as the executive director on the board of HSBC Asia Pacific and chairman HSBC India. She's the 2021 winner of the ET Lifetime Achievement Award here at the ET Prime Women Leadership Award. Wonderful to have you here again with us, Nana. And great to be with you, Meloni, on such an important subject. So thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Uh, you know, we'll go right into the conversation. Uh, according to a report by EY, 95% of the Nifty 500 companies have a woman on board of directors now. But less than 5% of companies have a female chairperson. In 2022, women accounted for about 7% of executive positions on Indian boards, compared to 6% in 2017. It still means that nearly 93% are held by men. Uh, the number of women in non-executive position on uh, positions on Indian boards has increased to 16%, uh, from 16% in 2017 to around 21% in 2022. How do you analyze this data? And what does it tell you about boardrooms uh, in India and women's place in that? You know, Meloni, I think we've now reached a stage where we can soon begin to celebrate what has moved. The needle has truly moved in terms of women representation on boards. Uh, I think uh, your own statistics, as you highlighted, uh, indicate that uh, in that particular intervention, which was important, the regulation that required a woman on board has more or less been achieved. And we can only now look to the one moment to two, and hopefully that will not require regulation, but best practice as people get convinced that uh, having that one woman on board adds so much value, why not have two? And for that one woman on board, I think it's often much easier to have two rather than be the only one and be a little bit of a goldfish in a bowl on that board. I think the other significant statistic that uh, you highlighted is uh, possibly even more important, and that is the role of executive women members in companies. And that increase is valuable because it shows that women have come up through the organization. We have had many women CEOs across different sectors, but we could do with more. And the pipeline, as we saw develop in banks, which were amongst the first to have women CEOs, uh, initially, you know, the smaller banks, uh, the foreign banks uh, like myself, and then moving on to, you know, State Bank of India, ICICI, Axis Bank, uh, we have shown that it is part of a journey. And once it's established across a particular sector, uh, in, and I say a sector because there are differences in sectors. Uh, we have seen success in banking, great success in IT, but it's typically been IT, foreign IT. Uh, mm -hmm. Our Indian IT firms aren't quite there yet, and yet the heads of the, you know, Accentures and others of that ilk have been women not once, but even twice over Intel, et cetera. Uh, we clearly have issues in manufacturing companies. Uh, there's a view, uh, wrongly, I believe, that women uh, are tough to uh, bring in to manufacturing companies. Uh, across the world now, there is a change therein. So sector by sector, it will need tackling. Some are still on the journey, others have well achieved it. And I think it is for those that have not to look at what they're doing wrong in terms of not attracting the right talent. And on the other hand, not thinking about what they need to do to make it happen. All right, you know, you spoke about the intervention by Sabi and that's a point that I'd like to get into a little later. 
Uh, but here, the data that we have shows that there are more women that are being absorbed in non-executive positions than in executive roles. Uh, what sort of an impact does this have, you know, on business culture and on the wider ecosystem? You know, I think both are important. Uh, the non-executive nature spiraled up because of the SEBI intervention. It would not have happened otherwise. And I was of the school of thought that women didn't need quotas, women uh, you know, would make it in their own time. But I believe I was wrong. I think we needed that intervention at that time to escalate it. I think we would have got there, but it would have taken much too long. So that intervention helped in the non-executive uh, nature of it. And I believe it will help the executive members to come up. And I can give you my own example. I was only deputy CEO of HSBC Bank when I got invited and with a good chance of being CEO. And it's possible that Nestle management that offered me the role of uh, being on their global board uh, hoped for or expected this. But uh, as a deputy CEO, joining a global board of Nestle was a big step for me. And I believe it helped me in the role that I finally filled as CEO of HSBC and then prompted HSBC to look at putting me on their Asia Pacific board, because there may have been a thing of, hey, well, if she's good enough to be on the Nestle global board, why not on ours? Because it was the first time that they actually looked at putting one of their country heads from India onto their global boards. And Mike is the Asia Pacific uh, board, which was you know 90% of the bank's business. So one helps the other. And I believe for every woman who served as a non-executive board member, and not just women like myself who are uh, in the sunset of our careers, but those in middle management who have come into boards will benefit in terms of what they learn, but will also be profiled with other typically male board members who then understand who they are, what their skill is, and suggest their name to be on other boards, that helps them in their executive roles because of the experience they've, they've learned, and I believe in time to also chair the boards. All right. Uh, you know, so you're saying that we'll create a pipe. I want to go back to uh, something that you said about the regulator intervention, you know, and that being the mechanism for increased uh, gender diversity on boards. Uh, how long do you think we'll continue to need these quotas? Because world over, we are seeing that these quotas are in place for women. Yes, and uh, you know the sort of 30% guideline, and we're not there yet in India for boards to have 30% uh, women representation, uh, is in some countries a mandatory requirement and some a guideline. And I think we have from SEBI also uh, specifics within this one woman, which is uh, that uh, it should move to being an independent director. So it's not just uh, particularly for the large number of family companies we have in India, which is a very big number, but that it's not just uh, a family member, but actually an independent uh, director there. So that's a refinement, which is important. And I think moving to two or 30% uh, are global guidelines. And uh, we will see that happen. A lot of change comes because the investor community, which is large and in fact quite critical to our big listed companies, begin to ask for this as they look at the governance components and evaluation of the companies in which they invest. And you will see that that push typically will happen in the large companies. And therefore, I have been on boards where it's not limited to 30%, but we had 40% women on the board. Uh, so you will see companies that are moving well beyond what uh, is an international guideline, but we do have lots of laggards in the country who hopefully copy what is big and working in India, but also who begin to understand that this works. And sometimes it's just, uh, you know, not that they don't want to do it. It's just a perception that it can't happen. Oh, uh, women, uh, you know, I want to have CEOs who have been, uh, who are women to come on my board. But, you know, there aren't enough who were women CEOs. But hey, by the way, for every board member you brought on, that guy, when he joined the first board, had not been CEO. So why this distinction? Uh, why wouldn't you just look at women through the same lens as you do the guys that you first bring on their first boards at, at the, uh, the first time? 
So I think the lens has to be the same. Women have to come on because of what they contribute to companies and they do. Uh, we are seeing now that in consumer product companies, the choices that women make count across consumer products, across durables, across even cars. And if women are amongst the consuming public in companies which are selling goods, then surely having that insight on your board is going to be helpful. Uh, you do have the talent that you can deploy that are women. In order to do that, do you not want to signal from the very top that you have adequate women representation? And at the top, I mean boards, yes, but also in terms of the executive. Because when I join a company, I want to know what, how do you view women? What is the culture of the organization? How do you empower me? And the role modeling that happens when I look up and I say, hey, look at these three women who are bosses or leaders in the organization where I am joining. Can, maybe I can be like them. Maybe this is the right company that will grow me into that talent. So that signaling effect is very, very critical as well. You know, you spoke about signaling being critical, but you also spoke about the lens, the fact that, you know, women are viewed differently than men are being viewed from your vantage. Can you tell us why that is? Why is it that companies still uh, look at women and see maybe a liability and they look at men and they see a possibility? I think it's just historic. You know, people who haven't done it uh, are just uh, afraid to try, uh, have a preconception, often wrong, but because they're the boss, there's no one to correct that. And uh, I fear that it will require that change. Uh, if you find and look at the kind of companies, you know, IT, banking, etc., which are far uh, more exposed to the global world, who work across different uh, societies and uh, mixes of people, we are used in our industries to working with diversity. Diversity of people, diversity of talent, a diversity of geographies. And so you get far less of the one type, one person, as you would see, say, in a manufacturing company, that particularly if it's one manufacturing company in one location. So I think some of it comes from the nature of companies we've had historically. And uh, we are incapable. Uh, and I think it's a failing of looking beyond that lens. Uh, for some who are lucky and have daughters who are capable at pushing and dinner conversations are around, you know, hey, dad, you're like in the dark ages, you're the dinosaur of today, help. So I think children are also bringing that change. Uh, and the change is there to happen. So those that don't get it are the ones that are already, frankly, being left behind. So uh, uh, I would rather say that it's time that they woke up. But there is a journey that uh, many have embarked on. And, you know, there will, of course, as is always the case, not be every one of which is a success story. But by and large, I do this dipstick check a lot. I speak to a lot of companies on this subject. I speak to their top leaders. I believe it's working brilliantly. And uh, as in women are being embraced uh, in these organizations, they are initially, if they face challenges, they're navigating it very well for themselves and for all womankind that follow. And the, the guys who are there, many, many are really more of a school where they would rather mentor the women, keep an eye out for them, uh, include and boast about that success rightfully. So I think we are now at that tipping point where we have gone from being way, way behind to one where the choices are going to be made as they should by looking through the same lens uh, to your question on that subject, where it should be about the quality of talent, the quality of contribution, the ability of the individual, and not through the lens of gender. But we need to keep, out, keep an eye out on the gender subject all the same. Uh, you know, that we do. So, you know, when you have companies who are actually, as you say, embarking on this journey, you know, where they're trying to look or attempting to do their best for women and by women, uh, should we be incentivizing these companies uh, with these kind of progressive cultures, uh, you know, where women are allowed to thrive and they also flourish? Uh, are there ways that one can do that? Is this even an option? So I think, uh, you know, 
guys like uh, uh, you, Meloni, uh, the fact that you focus on these subjects, uh, the the fact that uh, Economic Times uh, uh, awards, uh, uh, evaluates, uh, highlights, are uh, all a very critical part of that journey in terms of highlighting what is working and at times also highlighting what is not and why not, because we need to look at both sides of this. I do believe that uh, celebrating uh, success comes best. So for every company that wins an award, uh, one of the uh, preconditions should be not just complying with what SEBI requires, but also in terms of the quality. Is it an independent director? Is it two directors rather than one, et cetera? So when we set evaluation criteria uh, across everything we look at in that company and uh, the way maybe business schools also profile the company when kids are looking to apply, uh, continuously highlighting what the company is or what it isn't on all these criteria, yes, sales, profits, uh, definitely about the culture of the organization, but embedded in culture is the issue of diversity, of gender, of enabling, of uh, allowing each individual to rise to their full level of competence and ability. And that can only happen by uh, a company embracing what is right for every one of the people that joins them. And of course, to attract that talent. Now, attracting that talent is equally important, not just because we are able to profile that we are an organization that is committed to it, but also the way we hire. So right. if you send an all male recruiting group to a, a school where in fact, you would like to have at least what that school offers. So if it's 25% women, you should come back with a basket of at least 25% of the women, if not more. Uh, but how you showcase and represent your organization, have on the panel, a senior woman who is also therefore seen as part of the leadership of the organization. It also signals to the interviewee what you're about. So you have to think through this at every step of the way. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really something that companies have to, uh, you know, think through, put their heart into, and then uh, sort of strategize. These are my last set of uh, questions for you, Nana. You know, from your book, uh, 30 Women in Power, Their Voices, Their Stories, you write, as a woman in a top job, I believed I was always under a magnifying glass and that people were watching me closely. Every false step could be used as an advantage by others. In a man's world, I knew I had to perform better than all men to get what I deserved. Moreover, the first in my career brought the additional burden of respons burden responsibility of delivering. After all, any failure on my part would make it difficult for organizations to consider other women. That's a huge burden. Uh, you know, and I looked up, the book was uh, originally published in 2015. Uh, we are right now in 2023. As a, as a woman myself, and you know, there are many other women who will perhaps express uh, a, a similar sentiment when it comes to the burden of leadership. Uh, when you look back upon those words, when you see the ecosystem, and when you see what's changed for women, uh, what words do you have for young girls and women who'd like to lead, but maybe are told they're not good enough and, you know, that makes them hesitant? You know, uh, I'd like to believe that uh, the world has changed for the better. Eight years is a long time. And ideally, uh, we should not be feeling like uh, uh, we are being watched all the time and that our failures then get uh, carried over onto the perception of others, other women that are following uh, in our footsteps. I fear that that syndrome remains. I'm surprised how often I hear this conversation, oh, we put this woman in that role and it didn't work, so maybe we should now not think of putting another woman in that role. And it's like, is it really about men and women? Or was it just that she was not the right person for that role and why should we assume therefore that another woman can't do that role let's look at the talent it isn't about the gender uh, so you do get this kind of perception i mean you know when you put another man in the role of when a man fails uh how is it that we don't say hey 
that man didn't work, let's put a woman. You'll seldom hear it that way. So I think deeply embedded in uh, our male colleagues' minds is this. And they have to recognize their failing, that their training, their perception is one which is what needs changing. And I think for those of us who are sensitive to this, we should not hesitate to remind them. It's quite possible that there isn't another woman of the talents required to fill that role of the woman that failed. But let's look at the whole slew of talent in the, that basket that we have and determine it based on who we think fits on, on that. So I don't think we're there yet uh, in terms of the way we look at women and men and truly, truly looking at it as equal and then pick the best talent. So that has to be the first test. In terms of goldfish in a bowl, I think that hopefully has changed. There are far more women in the workplace. Uh, we aren't being watched as closely as we were earlier. And hopefully we allowed that little bit of space to fail like everyone else. Learn from our failings, not be punished by it. And certainly not have all of women, the womankind punished for it. Uh, so organizations have grown up. And uh, the world is a better place. But are we where we need to be or want to be? Absolutely not. So that journey is still one which uh, we are on. It's getting better, but it does need to be addressed uh, across the board. And men have to stop making excuses for what they are not doing right in this space. All right. You know, finally, uh, Nena, uh, what are the two or three things that women can do? Uh, and, you know, maybe men can do to help women in advance. So like anything, I think it is about making sure that the environment we have established is one where women can thrive. And this happens on many counts. The first is, of course, to go beyond the tick box exercise, because many organizations now understand what needs to be done, but to make sure that we are following through with heart and spirit in what is behind ensuring that we have that place. So yes, you can have maternity leave, but if every woman who comes back from maternity leave is punished for having been on maternity leave, not given the right roles, uh, not maybe in, allowed to advance through the organization along with the cohort group, all of this signals that it is still punishment. So how we re-engage with women in our workforce when they return from leave is one aspect of it. The second is, yes, leave may be there, but if everyone is like, hey, we don't want women on our team because they are getting to the stage where we know they will be taking leave for this reason, etc., it again becomes a discriminatory factor. So these, and I think we're all guilty of it, you know, when, when you're pushed to a point where you have to perform and deliver, this issue of carrying that weight is, or the weight of having a woman on your team who may not be there, who may not uh, come back, are all considerations which are quite understandable. But these are, at the end of the day, discriminatory. We have to recognize that for what it is and tackle it. And the organizations that do, that have the right philosophy, right understanding, that see these women who return as the long-time resource that they are, that they're very loyal to the companies that uh, have treated them well, uh, must realize that in the long run, <coughs> they benefit from what looks like a short-term uh, uh, difficulty, which is doing without that person. And the better the woman is, the more it's going to hurt when she's away. So in a funny sort of way, she's the one who's likely to be punished more because you want her back because she was so good at what she did, but she's the very kind of resource you want to retain. So I think... We need to have with us companies that understand heart and soul as to why they want these women and the women to stay and how they can embed them with the organization by treating them right when they're feeling the most vulnerable, which is when they're leaving the workplace temporarily to go and have a baby or uh, look after uh, other friends at home. I think a second area is about helping women themselves understand where they must say no to the load being put on them. And this can happen in various ways. 
So one would be that women themselves talk to each other so they can learn from how they're tackling these issues. And here, the big challenge for us right now is society itself, which has not changed. I saw a survey recently uh, which, in which 75% of the men said they were very happy to have their wives go to work. But interestingly, when asked about uh, and what is the primary role of the woman, they saw it as looking after the home and the children. Now, that is the dichotomy. Yes, she can go work, but she also has to look after home and the children. It's not seen as a joint responsibility. And as long as that is imposed by society on the woman, she cannot realistically juggle both roles without support. And it, it has to start at home with the husband, but also the in-laws, your own parents. I mean, how often is it that your own mother might be saying, hey, don't you think you should be home more with the children? Uh, aren't you getting a little carried away with your work? I mean, I certainly had that happen to me. And as a result, you begin to be filled with the same self-doubts you should be. Yeah. So for us as women to understand that, hey, it's time we rally the troops around us, our extended families, to come in and support us where they need to, and not just feel we have to be uh, the most important driving force at home with the family, be the right daughter-in-law, be the right uh, mother, be the right wife. And at the end of it, just collapse from that whole effort. And uh, some will throw in the towel at work because they find this is too much indeed to cope with. And we saw this in COVID. Women suddenly found they were home. They didn't have the advantage of a school system where their kids could go off to. Husbands at home. And uh, I mean, you ask any woman, is she happy at, you know, making chapatis at 10 at night for the rest of the family? I'm sure the answer is no. You love serving your family. You love doing what you have to, but you don't want to be the only one doing it or the expectation that you do it and you're a failure if you don't. So we have to have society itself also reflect on the burden it puts on working women and women also to say no. Uh, and I don't mean fight when you say no, but really help the family understand the journey you are on. You know, uh, it's not easy. And for a lot of women, I think it is tough. But as you say, it's very important that families and then through families, society at large understands the kind of burden that they put on women and share that load so that women can succeed for society to succeed uh, Nena Lal Kidwai, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here at the ET Prime Women Leadership Awards. Thank you so very much for your time and for your thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you, Maloney.